right. We're live. Here's what happened. You want me to lead it? I'll lead yeah, it if you okay. want. We, if you want. Be like riding a bike, man. For time's sake. Now, because I have no idea what the slides are. Where's the clicker? Do you have a clicker? Like, I was the clicker. Josh is the clicker. Hold on. Come on, hold on. We, oh, yeah. have, we have USB sticks we're sticking into Corey's work computer. Surprising no one. Why are you sticking with my computer? <laughs> <laughs> USB killer. Oh, good lord. Tim, just download this. It'll be just fine. Just a strange <laughs> USB device. Hold on, it's installing. It's installing my 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 rat. Yeah. Okay. Are they called rubber duckies? Yes, you did that. Yes, I remember that. Just look at the install. No, downloaded a whole bunch of. So how do I get on the slides? Ooh. There it goes. Hold on. Oh, you actually have transitions now. Yeah. I just screwed yeah. it up. You like <laughs> you turned off the TV. Well, how did I turn off the TV? <laughs> I don't know. But you I'm turned off the TV. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. He's already this is awesome. I just started using it, so more awesome. We're computer professionals. <laughs> Literally, the TV. Which is why we have. Is there, is there a TV repairman in the room? What are, yeah. What, man? New things don't change anything. I'm slowly taking over the entire network in this building. <laughs> Disconnect your vi devices now if you don't want to have unfettered access. So I think while they're trying to figure out how to make slides work. Like yeah, I was going to say, do it. Yeah, you can see a few new faces in the room. Um, welcome hold on, hold on. Welcome back to those of you who are here. There we go. My name is Adam. I started this. Silly organization with Tim. Um, and Tim's moved out of town to Tennessee instead of writing it myself. It stuck we pulled these three guys. Audio was still like slide there. Thank you. This, this is Jeff. I think, it, I think it's going to stop the transition <laughs> when you go back. <laughs> this is John. <laughs> and that guy over there is Corey, who's yelling at everyone about breaking his. Uh, yeah. <laughs> don't you don't go around the room anymore? No, we don't go around the room anymore. Oh. I told you things have changed. Apparently. <laughs> we'll have code names for our next meeting in January. Uh, armbands, if you are imbibing the adult beverages and you do not have an armband, we reserve the right to tackle you. So, let's see if you need an armband. Um, we have a Slack channel. You should get on the Slack channel. Things happen on the Slack channel. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, I, that's set up right now where we've got to approve you to join, right? Yes. Because that had been it's changing. Uh, it's your OSINT channel that you've gotten really picky about, right? Yeah, that's in a, that's in a different time. Yeah. Um, CPE credits for anybody who is looking for credit to maintain certifications, let us know. We can help you out with that. Um, I can give you an hour credit for every meeting you attend to, so for you attend. Um, we will have a sign-up sheet for that back in the food room. Um, I just need your name as you want it to appear on the CPE and your email address to send it to. So, um, I think that's it for now. You guys don't do the listserv anymore either? We do. No, yeah. the listserv's there. If you, yeah, I should have mentioned it there. Things fell apart when I left. Yeah, today. things completely fell <laughs> apart. So, um, yeah. um, if you'd like to be a part of our listserv, which is uh, fairly active but not annoying, um, I just need your email address and we'll get you added tonight. Um, honestly, you probably just see me in the back room and I'll add you in real time. It's much better. We'll and by see him, I'm, you mean see Corey, Josh, or Jeff, right. because he will lose your email address. That's the thing I do. Or we'll go down and leave it in public. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which may or may not have ever occurred. <laughs> Can't confirm. Can't confirm. Uh, the upcoming events, uh, we've got an OWASP meeting coming up on December 7th at 
6 p.m. out of training concepts. That's right. Do you want to talk about it? Or you um, it so, yeah, um, we just this week finally uh, finalized everything. So it's going to be December 7th at 6. We're going to do from you know 6 to 6.30 or so, we'll do like social kind of trivia and prizes, stuff like that. And then um, start at 6.30, we're doing fire talks. So there's going to be three fire talks. Uh, mine's on abusing uh, server side include and then um, the other two guys, they're doing one on hashing versus uh, encryption for passwords, and then the other one's on uh, app discovery and app inventory for the SDLC. So it should be a good time. Um, I guess that's it. Follow the site. I'm going to have the event right up within the week, and I'll probably put it on the Slack channel and stuff like that, too. To remind you guys. And these will be out there. I Google shortened everything because they were these monster links that like, were <laughs> taking up a slide each. So uh, trust me, really. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you go or, to or, those URLs at the end before you go back. <laughs> you, can, you can unshorten them. Uh -huh. um, Open Source South Carolina has a meetup on the 6th. Um, it's at SoCo on Gervais Street, and they're going to be talking about Vue.js. I'm too informed on what that is, but it's one of those things. They, that thing. If you're interested. <laughs> they do focus a lot on the development side of things and uh, have uh, gotten pretty heavy uh, with that. So, uh, but they do good stuff. That's Todd Lewis's group uh, coming in to, to do that. Uh, the ninth is B-Sides Greenville. Anybody going? Excellent. A couple of us. Um, hopefully, maybe we'll post up, get some uh, carpool or something going, or however that works out. Um, I know Robert's up there and is going, so let me try. We crash in this place? I, I, may, I may. Great. Good. Just show up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell it. Um, and then uh, the final upcoming event is actually next month's uh, meetup. It's actually a uh, mashup of the Colasec and the Cola Love groups. And we're having uh, another holiday party out at Conquest Brewing. Uh, same back time, same back channel. Well, not this channel, at least. It's out of Conquest. Um, uh, Corey. Uh, up at seven in the morning when all the rest of us bailed on him. <laughs> I was sick too, may I add. I'm, I'm going to rub this sick. one. This is, I was sick. Were you like texting or emailing? Where's everybody at? All right. Guys are getting ready to start. Crickets. <laughs> We're still here, brewing. Crickets. <laughs> Mia showed up. Mia showed up. Yeah. I uh, showed up halfway through. Yeah. I was able to put hops in. <laughs> My gosh. <laughs> um, uh, but it's going to be, a, I guess, an English style pale ale. Uh, we're going to probably stick with the brute force name like we did last year uh, with our uh, Scotch Ale and just kind of go from that. Unless people have another good idea, and uh, and uh, send that out to the group and we can talk about that. Uh, but the other thing that we're going to try and do is a chili cook-off. We'll probably do like uh, at least the first place and maybe a couple other uh, winners. Uh, give some prizes out for that, but put a pot of your, uh, your best chili on and, and bring it out. That night, and we can uh, we'll figure out. We'll probably make uh, whoever's bartending be the uh, the judge of the contest. They'll be the most impartial, unless it's Jan, right? <laughs> but yeah, so that's uh, that's coming up, and we'll have more information out uh, in the coming weeks as we uh, roll up for that. I guess a good place to slide this into uh, the stickers and shirts. I'm still. I guess I've kind of taken lead on that. Um, the one we have now is the stick figure, which I think was kind of jokingly put up. But the more I stare at it, the more I like it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's kind of being a thing. Um, so we're still looking at shirts, kind of designed for that. We have to have the design first before I can get pricing on it. Um, to cost. Okay. Um, so if, you, if any of you are creative, uh, feel free to let me know and design a sticker or something. Um, and we'll make that a thing. So. Also, uh, there's a Python meetup group in Lexington, for all you fellow Lexingtoners that don't want to drive the group yet. Uh, it's going to be in December. They don't have a date yet, but either I or someone else will put it up. Uh, yeah. Or Slack. Yeah. So, Does anybody else have other events that they know that are going on? Very good. Awesome. <laughs> oh, hey, it's my part. Um, <laughs> Uh, this will be more on the uh, the encryption front, I guess. Uh, Signal released their uh, desktop app uh, at the end of October there. Uh, you can do Mac or Windows, and then you've got the uh, 
bands to get it on. Yeah, I love Jimmy that. Bates, Linux. Um, I, I was messing around with it a little bit today. Um, it, it pretty much, you install it, it puts a, a QR code on your on your screen, you hit it with your phone that you've got it installed on already, and it just connects. Um, good to go. So um, I'll be playing around with it a little bit. I did change it from my old signal number to a brand new one um, that's amping through my pseudo uh, fake numbers. So um, I'll probably talk to a couple of you that I have in my contacts and see if it ratted me out or not, because I'm curious about whether or not it has. Um, so check that one out. Still pretty much the majority of, of InfoSec people say yay for signal, so um, no super bad stories about it popped up in the headlines. So I would recommend 1010. Does that send people messages to their phone if they have signal? Or do you, they also have to have the desktop app ready now? Um, it goes between. Um, I was I had my phone out and the desktop app, and I was seeing it populate on both, so it'll, it'll go to people's mobiles. And if you're talking to them on mobile or your desktop, if they're on desktop, so it's pretty convenient. Next slide, please. Um, picked up this story through Intel Techniques. Um, latest version of Firefox updated last week, um, and a lot of the extensions quit working promptly. Um, sure. <laughs> no script is fixed, because I just put that back up there. They, yeah, they said server spies. Some of them are working to update and catch up and get you know validated and accepted and stuff. Um, in the meantime, he did a blog there that teaches you how to get them reactivated in the Buscador VM, um, and it's technically just grabbing the extended support release version, um, which allows pretty much all the legacy extensions and add-ons to work still. Um, there's something that he kind of explains in the blog where if you have that set up and the other version, you kind of can make it work in the, the new version still, um, based on like your your profile in the browser. So. Um, if you're, he, he threw it out there because I think a lot of the OSINT based extensions got smoked first. Um, so if, if you need workarounds, check out those links and maybe you can get some of them back while you're waiting for people to catch up. Is there any information on if you use the extended support version, uh, how much it breaks the sandboxing and stuff they're doing? That I do not know. Um, Typically, if Bazell's pushing it, it's probably mostly okay as far as security right. and privacy. So I, I kind of taken that with a uh, leap of faith. Sure. Uh, but I have not dug into that yet, so don't don't take that as Bazell very difficult. Yeah. No. Nope. Other than that, I haven't played around with it a ton yet. Uh, supposedly, it's faster and blah 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 by Firefox. So. It's faster than Chrome. Anybody else had any? Good stories or horror stories by it so far? Yeah, they, they change where bookmarks are. <laughs> it's just yeah. fucking annoying. I, the, the, the visual shift has been the biggest yeah. headache I've had with it. Other than that, I, I will say that I, it's funny to me that um, Azure's, all of Azure's interface works better in Firefox and Chrome than it does IE. Because you're not using Edge. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I don't believe it. Um, but yeah, it's ended so far. Cool. What more animations? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Seems like you're struggling, man. <laughs> it adds suspense. Right. Um, so I was hoping somebody who was at the Linux users group last month was there. I was unable to attend. Um, they had it was a presentation on CyberStorm, um, which is it's supposed to be spelled with an S. Yes, it is. <laughs> Should have pulled this up. Um, anyways, Tim Fowler saw What he has. Oh, Mihai's there. Yeah. Hey. yeah, hey, yeah, I was going to say Tim Fowler talked on it. That's like sort of like his pet project. Uh, it looks really similar to kind of like what you're trying to do with, uh, I guess, Cola that Battlegrounds. Mm -hmm. So he's got like, you know, like automatics, automated setup for 
you know, a bunch of like servers and machines, like infrastructure, and then, you know, attack systems for it. So, you know, it's like a sandbox to play in. That's basically what Storm is. And, cool. Thank you. Yeah. And then they talked some about uh, patching on Linux and uh, LSOF and it leaving uh, files open and what that really means and what you've got to do basically means you have to restart the services in order to release the handles. I think short, very short of that. Um, I'm not sure how long that conversation went on for. I, I started listening to it today and, and then got distracted by a phone call. So, But yeah, the uh, link is right there at YouTube and uh, you can check it out if you'd like. Oh, transition Is that you behind the ski mask, Adam? <laughs> Maybe. There's not a facial hair too. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> we're we're trying to grab a couple of the, the cooler promos that we saw uh, getting passed around on Twitter and stuff. Uh, Shodan Pro accounts are gonna be five bucks for the next uh, several days, uh, down from fifty, which they usually cost. Uh, He's been doing that for the last couple of years. I, I picked one up and definitely handy if you need one. Uh, Pastebin Pro, that's the lifetime account, I believe, for $20. Uh, so that's out there. And then I couldn't tell how really good the deal was with Nord, but they typically do two-year deals. So they threw a three-year out there at $99. Uh, so I, I have a VPN. I use Freedom, and it's like 6 7 bucks a month. Yeah, so if you add that out, that's actually a pretty good deal. Yeah, it's I think it comes out with two seventy five a month or something. Did you see anything about Pro XPN? I know they ran a deal a couple, of, probably a couple of years back. It was free or not? Well, free. It was like fifteen bucks, for like a lifetime account. I, I, I came across one site that was kind of aggregating all the VPN ones, but Nord was the best one I saw on the list based on all the ones they were throwing out there. So that's all one I included. Anybody else seen anything? Good as far as cool hacker stuff for, for cheap. If you do see stuff, let us know. We might uh, make a post or a, a pin it up on the uh, Slack channel and just keep it updated if we get more stuff sent in. Yeah. Jeff said a dirty word. I said updated. <laughs> we did get that blog updated today. <laughs> <laughs> just in time for Is that for July or October? <laughs> <laughs> Am I supposed to move right along from this, or is there some kind of intro? Yeah. Adam usually dances. Right. Oh, did you actually have in the news stuff? Um, I didn't have anything like picked out, nothing super scary that I'm thinking of in the last couple of weeks. Does anybody have any fun news stories to share, discuss? Well, it was hacked in 2017, and they just announced it today. It was? Or Uber in 2016 was hacked. Yeah, Uber just came out. Just came out. Forever they say what they got with Uber. No, I, I, I personal information is all they said. Yeah. All right, go. Forever Twenty One is the clothing story. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna open up Forever Forty Nine. It's a <laughs> 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 only dead bad clothes. Virginia Slim 120s. Yeah. Didn't, didn't dig into it, but net neutrality was getting spiked that's, on. No, that's a hot topic right today, now. So, um, probably something to pay attention to. That's from next month. month. <laughs> 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 Let's talk about the death of net neutrality. Did, did you have one? Into the internet. We'll be crying into that custom beer. <laughs> right. there's, there's a good article on the Tenable website by the Nessus guys that have. Um, how to go out and find using Shodan, how to go after, um, I'm a big fan of Empire, I use Empire a lot, and how to go run down Empire servers, because Empire, we hard code 200 responses to everything, but we won't match on a slash versus an index.html, so they've got some ways that you can do it, they just include a module to find it. So on the Empire chat, we're like, okay, so we're working on the countermeasures, that's sort of an interesting article out there. Anyone? There was a uh, report, there's the two corroborated reports that Russia weaponized a Word document that went around the internet, Facebook, uh, for 
uh, targeting cyber professionals that were attending SciCon. Uh, that was a huge, huge flag for us. And our goal was to find out how many of our people were going to that, what was the risk, and how do we mitigate. Uh, the second story that came out about four days after the first story broke had a little more detail on how they did it. It's very similar to how John Strand does it in Black Hill Security, uh, but it does give you geolocation uh, for where you actually uh, download and remove the uh, document from. So if you registered for SciCon, you probably hit that document. Huh. Neat. <laughs> <laughs> Let's open all the documents. This correlated yeah. with the Uber data that was stolen. Right. <laughs> and the Forever 21 shopping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the real target. Who's so shopping at Forever 21? We're going to bring mail you a uh, nice USB care package. Um, so, our list of sponsors uh, hasn't really grown yet, but. There might be some growth here in the next couple of months. Um, my house moving is finally over, so I'm out of excuses for not getting things done. Um, so I'm to move again. Right. Well, now you got to unpack. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing. That's an ongoing thing, yeah. yeah forever. Um, but yeah, the look for some movement on both Battlegrounds and the sponsorship front. So, um, but yeah. Well, I think it's time for a little intermission, and unless somebody has anything else, yeah. there's food. Yeah, anyone yeah, has yeah, anyone not eaten food, food we'll beer? Food. We brought some growlers, but uh, we'll take about five minutes to get Tim set up with his laptop for his presentation. Yeah, and then, uh, <laughs> they said five minutes. We can do that in five minutes. Yeah, well, that's a challenge. You should accept it. Oh, accept the challenge, Corey. I've been challenged all day. I'm yeah. challenged, challenged. Okay? <laughs> so the growlers back there. One, yeah. one is some more refreshments, and we'll be right back. One is a uh, guy Fox that's from Nashville, and then there's a milk stout with just D block on it. That's a homebrew from one of my coworkers. So if you're going to try the milk stout, make sure you put it in the cup and wait 10 to 15 minutes. He said that's the best way to drink it. So you let it warm up a little bit. So. Yeah, go help yourself. Speech longer is actually All right, let's try this. Your slide with a tiny rig. Do not come at me with a high school and say, let's try this. Wait, bad memories? Or? I, I, well, I don't want any new bad memories. Okay. So, I think. So, you should just be able to throw this like on this screen, right? And I should be able to just present yours. I present you to everyone. I'm going to go in for a little bit more. Is it show? We need to set it. Oh, I got to do this though. You can't, but I can. Yeah. I'm about to hit you Everything transfers to the screen. Like all my ECPI transfers. But what I have left now is like lazy science, like biology, something like that, and a ton of math. You're presenting to everyone. It says your screen share. Spread those out. We'll take them all in one semester. We're not transferring for everybody. Right before it. So. Did you stay uh, for the joke rating, my stalker? No. Uh, oh, did you just oh, read the Two or three sets. Is that what happens? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay. It just took a while for everything. I had it out of pocket for some of it at first. So, so it, a lot of this, so we did the, we're doing CEH, we're going to do the PPP. Uh, I'm going to keep the page right now. And they do never fit by us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. The chapter oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I don't know. It'd be kind of funny. What are we talking about physical security? Yeah. What are you going to do with that one? You know, you know, you'd, you'd be breaking yeah. Yes, what's it? Right. So so I got a field trip. I got a bunch of big books. I'm about three kilos of cocaine in that room. Yeah. There it is. Or an escape room. This is uh, yeah, got an idea. Yeah. Yeah. You can't lay off with the like, no. oh, oh, man. The room would be amazing. I want to do it. I wonder if it's something. I haven't done one yet. But you imagine get to it. One of the like first questions that you get to pick is locked. It gets me to get to the That would be awesome. That would be awesome, but I would be screwed. I would be like 20 minutes in. Come on, man. Sorry, you frustrated uh, and never so excited. As soon as I told him, even like people I work with, they're like, oh, I want to learn how to pick a lot. I'm like, I'll show you. I have days where I can just do it. Do a bunch of learning. And then days where I'm just like, yeah, lock picking for whatever reason never appealed to me. I don't know why. I think it's neat and I can never do it. I always sit there, you know, like on a break or something. This isn't going to work, anyways. I just can't. Yeah. Even the easy ones, I'm like, try this one, this one's the clarify. easiest one, I'm just like, I just... Are you sure? <laughs> uh, yeah, right. I'll just hook up. Like, I'm going to have to hook up anyways. I'm going to be lying this if I ever walk myself Actually, into the house. Yeah, was, you need to be able to share like, your screen. Uh, I bought like six new trains, I'm not going to be able to see it either way. This yeah. is true. Yeah. yeah. It said Firefox doesn't work? Firefox doesn't work. What? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Oh, here's what we can do too. I don't have to even log in. <laughs> I, uh, the kid that I got, I got a share of the It starts at like one, uh, then code goes up to the floor. I don't think it's going to work. It's got one, it's got one thing, stand, it's everything. Wow. We need to, we also need to like, <laughs> I always appreciate it when I get to the, the ones that are actually in the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you, you pick padlocks. It's a better word. Yeah. I feel like, though, I've done a couple Google things go to like one of those recently, and, and it didn't work in Chrome. Stuff. And I was like, what? You're Google. Oh, God, uh, right. angles are off. I can't do it. Uh, yeah. It was neat seeing the one at um, the Charleston. Yeah. B sides, because yep. it had like four levels. And that was fun to watch people. <laughs> got out of the cuffs, and I couldn't get that. I could not get the top one. I never got the first one on the frame. Yeah. Uh, okay, I still need to hook up though. Where's the HDMI cable? Where's the video game box? As you can progress. How far does that reach? Not very far. Yeah, it's a little bit last year. Can, oh. Can you get a longer HDMI cable? I think so. Oh my god. But that thing was actually hard. Yeah, I think it was We have to plug it into the TV and let's see if you have like a connector or like a. Yeah, it's like the ten Right now, I'm going to slide down all the stairs first. I got so if you go to point, like that, you go look for the Yeah, if I present you to everyone, Canadian. Yeah. Oh, man, come on. 
That's what I'm doing.
Okay. Hello. 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 Do you want them to do your introduction? No, that's the same reason we're not going to do it. We've looked at doing it. Yes, I want Adam to do it. I mean, I'm not trying to twist your arm. PTX. We don't have your slot anymore. Yeah, we don't have any slots anymore. Every time I think of it, I think of it. Do you want to do it? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And then, you know, there's something that really is. This is what. You know, I, I take a, a, at least a few yeah, sections just to kind of get a baseline for the course of the like, And, you know, and, uh, the cool thing about the they uh, definitely have, uh, uh, they update a lot of their services. So, like, the final. Uh, why is it coming through? Uh, they, they did that like two or three times this year. So, that's kind of cool. So the yeah 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 Sort of, he started out as a general security engineer, um, pretty quickly got into doing uh, web testing and basically built our web security platform at the company we were at from the ground up. Um, and he has basically made his career about it with his new company he's with now. So um, he's a gigantic troll and an enormous pain. But he's a good friend. We love him. So Aww. get started, Tim. Okay, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so I, it's been a while since I've actually been to one of these. So who's all new here? Like tonight's the first night. Cool. Um, you will never it's like see Fight me. Club. You will never see me again. <laughs> <laughs> until next year. Yeah, until next year. Actually, yeah, it does land in November, so I'll be back next year with potentially another talk to talk about. I'm just taking up your November. I actually did, I did take up January and November, so I started the year as the presenter and ended the year. Um, is anyone here a developer? OK, cool. I want your feedback at the end of this talk, because this talk is not for security people. This is for um, developers. I have gotten accepted to speak at November in Nashville, in, which is Monday. I'm also speaking at Code Mash in January. So uh, we'll actually get into why this talk. Um, and that's to, from, I, I've done a lot of security conferences. I've done a lot of talks there. Uh, and that's great and all. I, I do it from that perspective. But to really make an impact with security, particularly with an application security, I need to get with the developers and give them guidance on security. So my role is I sit with the development team and I, I am their security resources. They come with me to me with questions. I provide guidance on different security topics. I don't sit with the security team. We have two different buildings because we can't fit everybody in one building. Uh, the security team is in our, in our south office, and I'm in the north office. So I'm completely and utterly all myself up there, which is actually kind of great. And I think getting a security person into a different department is, is really good because it really allows you to be more personal with them and get build that relationship with them to really make an impact with security. So, uh, but this talk, I'm trying to get outside the echo chamber within security. We have all these great ideas about how to improve security, but a lot of that requires other departments, so the development team, system administrators, network administrators. Um, so I want to get out and actually get in front of those folks. Um, so this is a talk on how to embed security into your process. So within the developer process, how to use the security tools, activities, and things like that. You will probably, if you're here for security, take something away from this. <laughs> or if you already didn't know, or if you already knew some of this stuff, hopefully it builds some confidence that like that's the right way of doing things, or you know, you're on the right path. Because I've been to talks where it's like I'm expecting to get something new and I don't, but it builds my confidence in that, like, okay, I'm doing things the right way. Um, so security wins. So I like focusing on some of the wins before I dive into like making improvements within within the development process. Some of the things I'm seeing developers do really well is 
uh, at least from my experience, is peer and code review. So this is not something that developers like doing, but it's something that managers love doing. And um, it really ends up being about how how good your code is. And it really starts conversations about why are you doing it this way? We, we thought about it that way. It's really helpful for like junior developers and senior developers are looking at the code and there's questions being asked and discussions being had. Um, ultimately, secure code is quality code. So if you have quality code, you're gonna have a lot of security embedded within the process. Um, using frameworks and, and as those frameworks, using the security features within those frameworks. Um, there's a lot of security being built into a lot of the frameworks nowadays that developers are using to build out these applications. And so using that and you know not rolling your own crypto and different things like that is really beneficial for security. It's, it's kind of being baked in at that point. And then I've been really impressed with encryption and certificates and the fact that, um, you know, when I say we need to, you know, do secure traffic for this, like most developers know what they need to do. You know, they have a basic understanding of encryption and how to get a certificate within an application. Um, I still feel like I don't know everything that needs to be known about that, but I'm really impressed with the fact that, because it's a very deep field, but I'm impressed with what the developers know and I don't have to go and explain, well, you know, you have your public and private key and, you know, all this and that. And, you know, so so I think that's really good. And even from that standpoint, knowledge as a whole, I'm finding that developers, when I say we need to do this from a security standpoint, they know what I'm talking about. And so, you know, they have a lot of knowledge already. It's just building up that confidence. And I've seen, like, a developer write two paragraphs of just, like, in a design discussion of, of you know, taking security in consideration. And it was great up until the last sentence, which was, well, but I'm not a security person. Like, like everything before that was awesome, but you know, I'm not a security person. They just did what we do as a security person. Or we do whatever the, what, oh, oh, oh. we do, they just did what I would have done. And they probably wrote it, wrote it a lot better because I can't speak. <laughs> Um, more feel free to interject. I'm surprised you haven't trolled me yet. <clears throat> more Red Bull. Yes, more Red Bull. Be, be back there. Um, so here's the roadmap for this talk. We're going to talk, and I, I built out this talk in the way that the development life cycle kind of goes. You have your design, you have your coding activities, and then you have testing. And so we're going to talk about inventory, threat modeling, uh, coding activities and tools, and we'll get into some demos with the tools, and then resources and training options for you know improving a security mindset. So, how to embed security, step one, inventory. And I know what you're thinking. Ah, oh, inventory. You know, no one likes doing inventory, but this is kind of what an environment can look like. Can I have an inventory of the tools that you've got listed? <laughs> sure, yeah, they're right there. They're documented right there on the slide. I'll give you the slide after the, after the, after the presentation. Um, this is, and this is one, like, this is a slide that is, like, if you go look up, like, application technology and different things, there's much bigger graphs than this. And I'm sure as many of you are looking at this, you can probably point out a couple of these technologies that have had vulnerabilities in the last year, two years, last month. Um, so there's, there's a lot of stuff, and you need to know what's in your environment, because if you're going to address security, you want to be up to date on all this <coughs> stuff. Um, Prime example, Equifax, Apache Struts 2 vulnerability that did, never got patched. Now, some of that is system administration, you know, but, you know, with the DevOps and a lot of stuff going on and developers taking on more of that sysadmin type role, it's very important to understand what's, what your application is running on and being able to go actually address that vulnerability. A more developer focused is NPM left pad. Does anyone, anyone hear about this? Sure some of the developers have, yeah, yeah. So what happened was uh, within NPM, there are these modules that you can use within your application. Uh, you can use modules as a dependency of a dependency of a dependency of another module. Left pad is just simply like adding a pad to the left side of the page. Well, there was a dispute in the name, and so the author decided to unpublish it, and it took down a bunch of websites because it was a dependency, and it just it was gone, so the application didn't know how to work anymore. So this is a prime example of understanding what's in your environment and you know being able to, one, respond to something like this, um, 
but you know, it, and this is not even a security vulnerability. This is just a business thing. Eventually, what NPM had to do was republish this back up, despite the author being like, "I'm out of here," <laughs> um, which they don't ever do. They don't ever put back up on published packages. So, speaking of NPM, um, this is where we kind of shift gears a little bit. NPM, I attribute it a lot to WordPress in that. Um, you know, WordPress core and even Node core is really solid from a security standpoint. It's when you start adding plugins, modules, uh, I think they call packages too, uh, that you really have to be careful because anyone can create a module. Anybody can create a plugin. More recently, we've had malicious packages. Um, and as you can see there, all they're doing is typo squatting. So these are packages that are meant to siphon information out of applications. And so if you mistype it, um, then you could potentially install a malicious package into your environment. Uh, there's also things like insecure defaults. This kind of goes back to a little bit of configuration management. And then there's all directory traversal. There's arbitrary code execution. There's malicious, another malicious packages and just pack all the things. So there are a lot of uh, things that need to be concerned. And this kind of goes along with inventory inventorying and understanding what NPM modules you are using. To do that, I use uh, RSS feeds. No Security Platform has a really good one, and Sync.io has, has another one, too. What's great about Sync.io is it does multiple languages. So it does Maven, it does Ruby, it does uh, other things in NPM. No Security Platform is just focused on that. Both these are just services that do security research, and um, you can pay to have like more in-depth uh, services from them kind of focus more on the security research side of things. Also, uh, GitHub now is yeah. notifying you of libraries that are out of date. Okay. Uh, so if you have it, it'll automatically say, hey, this library and this uh, program is needs to be updated. And ties it to the CVE. Yep. Oh, really? Okay, that's cool. I hadn't heard about that. So that's a good thing. Um, another thing that you can, another, so another activity that we can do within the design phase is threat modeling. Is anyone here familiar with threat modeling? Adam Shostak. Yeah, Adam Shostak, that will be at the end. Um, so kind of what is what is threat modeling? Well, you want to keep it simple uh, as far as getting started with it. It's basically, you know, if you're driving to work or you're driving here, uh, you want to, um, you, you're, you're calculating, okay, is this person going to get into left lane? You know, is this truck going to swerve into me? What am I going to do if this happens? You know, I'm going to have to slow a break. Is the left lane clear? You're kind of doing it on a regular, on a day-to-day -day basis. This is more uh, just taking those activities and putting it into, um, you know, your application and kind of thinking about it ahead of time. Uh, figure out what's works best as far as threat modeling. It can be, there's a big, uh, Ralph just mentioned the Adam Shostak book, uh, which is 300 pages or so. It's a, it's a very in-depth book, but even the first chapter, it's like, hey, uh, you know, just just take what you what we've what we've talked about here, and just start going to do it. Um, and we'll walk through some of the process of getting started with that. And realize nothing is going to be 100 percent accurate. You're not going to be able to figure out all the flaws um, by keeping it simple. You want to take just a piece of it like on a very high level. If you try to do the entire application all at once, you're going to you know be in a eight hour long meeting and not have any fun. Um, I actually just had the opportunity to recently do this and set this up within. Uh, with the devs that I just started working with, and it actually turned out really well because we we had we figured out three different vulnerabilities that we needed to address, and um, you know it, it allowed us to have that discussion. And actually, at the end of it, I got them thinking more like attackers because uh, they suddenly realized that they could lock out every account within the organization if they wanted to because they were building the application that, that tied into Active Directory. And so they got a little, started getting a little mischievous, which I was actually kind of proud of, that they started getting a little evil and malicious. So that's, that's the whole point of it, is you're trying to look at your application and how can I get around this? So the first thing you want to do is set your scope. Uh, you want to look for the, what's the purpose of the applications. And if you're dealing with just a small piece of your application, what is that actually doing? Then you want to list out your assets. So what's within the application? Uh, I actually have a graph here that'll show you kind of a, a, a data flow diagram. Um, that you, and that's pretty much what you're using for this kind of stuff. 
Uh, one thing to be concerned with as far as scope goes is watch for scope creep because, and this happened in my meeting where I had, uh, we were discussing about it and, you know, we started going down this rabbit hole and it's like, whoa, that, we're actually getting way too far. This is not like we start talking about username and passwords and that had nothing to necessarily do as far as our piece of the application. Um, and this is an example of a data diagram. Each each piece kind of has its own thing. So you've got you've got your anything that's stored on a um, like a disk or on a server. Uh, you got your process, and then you got your flows here. And then these dotted red lines are all trust boundaries. Um, so it's, it's supposed to be fairly simple. And then you just talk about you know how could uh, I break into to this application or what can I do? And you know it can it can be. You know, well, I can try to do SQL injection. Do we have input validation in place? Um, so you uh, uh, kind of just walk through the diagram, use that. I actually did not, like when we first did our first one, we did not have a diagram. You usually draw it in the meeting, but the developer, one of the developers showed up with the diagram that he wanted to go through. So like that was great, and we just used his. Uh, OWASP, Ralph can talk more about and go to the OWASP meeting. I will talk more about OWASP later on and actually talk about some more tools. Uh, OWASP is Open Web Application Security Project. They have a page on there, um, and they have a page for just about everything within application security. So once you've got all this, you got your scope set up, you want to do your security profile. And you want to list all of the security features that you have within your application, input validation. What are you doing for input validation? How are you handling encryption? What type of cryptography are you using? Um, authorization, uh, authentication, you know, what is in place from a security perspective? Because that's going to allow you to go, like, think, how can I attack this? Well, you know, you can't necessarily see the traffic because it's, you know, encrypted. So, you know, that kind of eliminates one attack vector there. Then from there, and this is kind of what we're getting into here, we're going to identify and document the threats. And the, the typical one, the most popular one is called STRIDE. We love our acronyms, by the way. Uh, spoofing, which is pretending to be somebody. Uh, tampering, which is manipulating information, uh, changing it. And then repudiation is saying, I didn't do it. Info disclosure, uh, denial, or, yeah, denial of service, and then elevation of uh, privileges. Um, and what you do is you, you, you talk through this and you want to document at the same time, document the attack, the target, and the countermeasure that you're going to be putting in place. And then we're not done there because we're going to use another acronym called DREAD. And this is what allows you to rate the threats. This is what allows you to prioritize what threats you need to focus on. And you're going to rate uh, low to high. So low is one, two is medium, three is high. You're going to rate uh, damage potential, reproducibility, exploitability, affected users, and discoverability. And you, you, know, you kind of want to keep it as, as simple as possible because then what you do is you add all of them up and they give you like a number base of what uh, you know, what's the priority? What's the biggest risk within your application? So, and it's again, one through three. So it's very simple. You don't need to you know, go through a big rating system to really get this done. And um, some resources available for doing some of this stuff. There is the OWASP Threat Dragon, which came out this spring. Uh, the project lead for that is actually looking for some feedback on, on its use. You can install it as uh, with Docker. You can, it's got a local install. It integrates within GitHub. Uh, it does a lot of nifty things, and it's fairly simple. It's built on Node.js and Angular. So um, if you're doing that kind of stuff, it's kind of cool. Uh, Draw.io, which is what the developer that we used his data flow diagram for, he used that. And then, of course, we got threat modeling by Adam Shostak. If, if, yeah. Huh? Bruce Snyder's got the CMOS too. Got the what? C monster tool. C monster. C monster tool. Okay, I hadn't heard of such. Um, C monster. Like S E A. Okay, so C monster. I messed around with Threat Dragon a little bit. You can definitely tell it's in like early stages of development, but it's to do data flow diagrams. You don't have something else. Visual Studios or something like that. Um, so moving on, uh, coding activities, and I know what you think. This is the fun part. This is where developers really get into it. Um, I do have a little bit of a disappointment. Uh, I thought there'd actually be more here. Before we get to that, security vulnerabilities are ultimately bugs. Um, 
when I came in, we had to figure out how we were going to prioritize security concerns. And really all it was was just using the bug process that was already in place. We had a defect matrix with uh, low, medium, high, and critical. And they already had like timelines and you know how they were going to be addressed and how they were going to be worked. Uh, secured, the security vulnerabilities that we found uh, with that. We just put it in and worked it. Medium, a medium security vulnerability doesn't need to be worked before some high priority business uh, taken. So, you know, it really should be uh, a, one, a discussion, but two, you know, it, security doesn't need, necessarily need to jump to the front of the line. It can be worked along with just everything else because a low, low vulnerability is just that. It's a low uh, possibility of exploit. And really, um, one thing that I have learned working with the developers is that I get their security reports now for their application, and I have called BS on the security vendor. I have bitched and moaned to people about these security vendors who just run a scan and then you know throw out a report. So if developers are getting uh, security reports and not having a security person work with them on it, like that's 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 the one that's not doing security. It's it's just utter crap. You can tell I'm getting a little upset, um, but. Uh, you know, I go through and look and I call BS and it's like, and, and their rating system, they're saying this is high. I'm like, no, this is a low. This is not an issue. I have had someone tell me that we don't have automation protection or, uh, within our application. So one, you have to authenticate, get in, and then, you know, they can just flutter feedback, which it's like, okay, we'll just go delete every, all the feedback in there. You're not going to take our application down or anything. It's feedback. Uh, and that was like a, a medium or high. We're like, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll accept the risk on that one. I didn't even think, bring that one to the developers. I was just like, that's just good crap. Surprising, once you step onto the other side of things and you start working with some of the security stuff that you see uh, some, of, some of our own faults. So IDE plugins. I was really excited about this because this is a great idea in that you can just use a plugin with uh, you know, some of the IDEs developers. And so as they're coding, they're getting feedback on potential security vulnerabilities that they're putting into their application. They're out there. I haven't used them much. Uh, it's not really that great. Research is that I did find this article um, that talks about IDE plugins. And they found this nice big list of stuff. So again, they're out there, there's some interesting things out there, but really, if you can see there with the highlighted area, there is a lack of information and they don't explain how they're actually scanning for security vulnerabilities. And so, I don't know if anybody, I'm looking at the developers, so if you guys use any IDE plugins for security things. We or if you know of any that are really good. So we don't use IDE stuff period in our environment because that doesn't work well in continuous. That works on the developer's laptop. Right. But we have a continuous integration deployment environment. So anything is just gravy that's sitting in the, that environment. For us, we have static code analysis or linting, right. right, which is going to occur. So there might be fine bugs or whatever else. And then we'll write custom ones that look at the abstract syntax tree right. in order to, buy, to find anti-patterns, um, appending, um, string appending on an SQL statement, for example, mm -hmm. and bad things like that. But for us, Anything in an IDE is useless because that works on my laptop versus we have to catch it in the build, right? right. That catches everything. Running or having something running locally for you, for us, it all has to occur within the build pipeline. I got you. Okay. And that's that's just the difference, you know, different different environments, people do different things. Um, and that's ultimately what these IDE plugins are doing is they're doing linting or, or static analysis on your code. So, I mean, and static analysis has its own problems, which gives me. Um, one cool thing that I did, and this is focused on NPM, uh, because I'm speaking in November and Monday, uh, is if you're using Atom, there's an NPM outdated plugin that will pretty much check for outdated NPM modules, packages. Um, so that's pretty good, again, for keeping things up to date uh, and, and catching stuff ahead of time, because we're going to also talk about the Node Security Platform, which has a tool which, which will check for outdated plugins or uh, outdated packages that have actually have vulnerabilities in them. So, how to embed security? I know what you're thinking. Eh, tools. It's demo time. Developers love developers love tools. By the way, I could not get an abstract past a developer uh, review board until I said we're going to do demos. So, a lot, and that's what I've, I've gotten feedback from some of my developer friends that like they're like, yeah, we want to see something technical. Um, so we'll walk through some of that stuff. The Node Security Platform, which I've already kind of talked about with the RSS feed. 
Uh, they do a lot of vulnerability research. Um, it's it's very you can put. Uh, it has a tool that will check for your NPM packages and let you know if they're out of date and if there's a vulnerability in one of them. And you can use that then to break builds. And you can use it either within your continuous integration pipeline or um, within you know pull requests. And so you have two options of where you can put it depending on your environment. One got you about NSP is you need to keep it up to date. So the vulnerability database is not going to update unless you keep it up to date. Um, yeah. One thing I noticed: uh, static analyzers, which are which are which can be great, can be awful. There are two varieties. You've got the open source, which usually focuses focuses in on one language. Um, you know, it can be hard to find for your particular language, and you know, be kept up to date too. Uh, so it's kind of hit or miss there. The commercial versions uh, are expensive, but they will handle multiple languages. So if you have a uh, an environment where you have multiple languages, it can you know definitely help with uploading of code and, and, and scanning for that. And there is a big OWASP page for this uh, that I actually have my notes. If anyone wants some, the slides, I'll be happy to share them. Um, we've used, uh, so we, we've put the static analyzer in place for our uh, build process. And we use, um, so within Jenkins, there's plugins. They have a lot of plugins. And usually for static analyzer, you can just grab that plugin and configure it for your static analyzer. And what ours does is it will go out, um, grab the code when there's a build created, or when there's a build initiated, but go out, grab the code, uh, pull it down, shoot it up to our static analyzer, and then from there you have an option of either breaking the build if there's a vulnerability, or scanning it like transparently. Putting a static analyzer in place, you need to start that transparently, because static analyzers, are notorious for false positives. There's a ton, tons, 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 tons of them. I spent three months tuning our static analyzer so that I didn't break uh, the developers' builds on, on BS findings. Um, we, we did eventually put it into break builds, and we break builds on one high, two medium, three lows. And uh, that was put in place to one start conversations, but um, also, you know, we're not just breaking on one medium, one low. Um, but you know we are kind of having a conversation around. Well, what is this? Why is this here? Uh, so they should still get warned whenever there is even just like one medium or uh, one low. Um, dynamic analyzers. Uh, this uh, static analyzer just just scan code in its raw form. What a dynamic analyzer does is it allows you to proxy your traffic between your computer and the application, and this allows you to then map the application and um, attack it pretty much. It's a really nifty tool. So what we will do here is I am going to change my display because trying to do a demo on a second screen is awful. And I have a VM here. I already spun up. Did you make a sacrifice to the demo gods? I, I dear goodness, I hope so. Um, I actually might have Heavens to. No. I might have to restart. Yeah, I might have to restart Zap. So, is is there a it works a small furry critter in pieces in my backyard now? <laughs> um, so if you look in here, has, has anyone played with Zap before? Is this a new tool for people? Has everybody heard about Zap? People not heard about that. Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, so one of the first things that draws everybody eye, and I, I gave developers this to play with the first time. First thing they did was put their URL in there and hit attack, and that's great. But it does just like a base, like, like a very shallow scan of the website. What you want to do is um, set it up as a proxy. And if you don't know how to set it up as a proxy, we'll walk through it. So we've got our local proxy settings. So it's pointed at the local host, and you're using port 8080. And then you come over to your browser here, and I have Foxy Proxy installed. And you can see the options here. Can't change that. Um, it is called Burp. Burp is an alternative to Zap. Zap is free, so uh, it's completely and utterly free from OWASP. Um, so that's why I'm using that. Uh, so you can see there I'm pointed at one, one, two, which is essentially the local host, 8080. So when I put that in place, I'm able to then 
uh, go through the application, and this is Pwned Hub, which is from uh, a Tim Tomes course called the Practical Web Application Penetration Testing Course. Um, big mouthful there. Um, and all you do to get stuff within Zap is to traverse the website. So we'll, let's set up a user Colasac, Colasac. I want to give me a password. Colasac. Colasac. <laughs> Call a sec all over case. Favorite food? Who's got favorite food? Call a sec. Call a sec. <laughs> I'm with that fails. Register. No. Oh, I forgot my password. Let's do call a sec. Favorite food is call a sec. Then we can set a new password. New password. Trip. 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 <laughs> So, and this is all, all I'm doing is, and then I can go back here and type in Colasac and do shrimp. And then you can go through the rest of the application. What should have been happening over here if I wasn't a dumbass? Wait, let's see if it, yep, nope, it's in there. So, um, so within this, then you can see that we started mapping, you can see the reset, the registration, notes, login, all that different stuff that we performed on there. Uh, we will then do attack. And we can spider the website. So spidering is, you know, like Google Spider, where it goes through and it goes clicks on all the different stuff, looking for different things within the application. Maybe you missed something. You, these indicators here show where the spider found something that you did. I have a question on this board. I assume I've always kind of word. Um, does this hit locally on the site that you proxy, or does it actually hit the site whenever you're running that spider? Like, so we proxy the data. Does it save it locally and get some of the machine for you to interact with? Or is it actually going out to a live production site? Spider? I mean, yeah, it's going out to the site, and you'll see traffic from it. Like, if you were if you were to look at like logs or something, yep. yeah, it's going to the website and it's going through and just clicking on the, all the stuff. So it's not, yeah, I see what you're saying. It's not if, doing if local. You're, yeah. If you're doing this across a firewall or IPS, that's going to look at your traffic and start blocking you. It straight up will. Yeah, like if you if it's if it's yeah if it's set up to do bot detection or something. IPS is hate. Yeah, yep. yeah. You need to if you're gonna do this, it's best if you get as close as you can to the you. server on the network. Right. <laughs> so, actually, if you kick off one of those scans and your IPS doesn't block traffic, yeah, you get right. rid of your IPS. Yep. It's, yeah. yeah. Or at the yeah, very least, pop the hood, make sure it's turned on. This <laughs> is this is something I should mention here. Um, do not go attack somebody else's application. This is for your internal test only. Don't go like I was messing with them. I'm not going to go actually mess with this company because I can get in trouble. If um, you do, do, use Tor and jump through. Come <laughs> <laughs> on, let's talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Opsec, You're have fun. Have fun safely. Yeah, OPSEC is very important. <laughs> if you are going to go mess with somebody else's website. There are bug bounty programs out there that allow you to go. Although most of them do say like you can't use a scanner, which is funny. Um, but so yeah, we spidered the site. You can go uh, more in depth here. Uh, you can do an AJAX spider fit AJAX content. Force browse looks for hidden directories. It can take a long time, um, depending on your word list. But active scan is where the fun really begins. As you can see here, I am. This is what the scanner is doing, and it's walking right now. It's going through path traversal. Then it'll go through remote file inclusion. We will go ahead and skip a little bit here and get to the good stuff, which is cross-site scripting and SQL injection. So, um, yeah, that's this is pretty much what you do. And then from here, you take the report and you can go. You want to go confirm these findings because dynamic analyzers do have false positives as well. So it'll give you the URL that uh, had the issue and the attack vector that you can then go confirm within the application. Um, once that's done, I'm going to actually stop this. And you can see here we have an alerts tab. So we've already, it already found some SQL injection. It's got, it's got uh, right here is the URL, so the registration URL within the username field. There is, that's an attack because I got it, I got a 200 response. So you can come up here, this is another cool thing, is that you can see your request. And you can see we made the request right there in the username with the SQL injection. And we got a, all the scanner's doing is checking for it. It's got a 200 response. So again, you need to go there and actually confirm that you have a vulnerability because scanners are just kind of, these these things are based in, uh, the alerts are based on rules that are looking for different things and different interactions within the application. 
so that is that is and that's that's as simple as that has to be. And if you're working in you know the new uh, agile environment, you know this, that should be a fairly quick scan. Um, okay. Um, so you can do it in like small small pieces. You don't have to do a full application like uh, some pen tester or security person would need it. So uh, as you can see there, uh, oh, and that proxy, another, another little fun note, was made by Simon Bennett, who is a Mozilla developer, or a developer at Mozilla. So he, he's not a security person. He wrote this tool because he wanted to get a better understanding of security and you know how to attack an application. And it just so happened that security people found it and were like, hey, this is a really good tool. Um, Burp Suite is the alternative to that and is probably, uh, well, it is the preferred by most application security professionals. Um, it, it, it has a free community version, but it's the, a lot of the automated stuff, scans, is, is throttled. Uh, so you'll have to, um, yeah, yeah, what? Um, so it's $300 a year if you want to get a, get a subscription, which really isn't that much, so. So now the cloud. Let's talk about the cloud. And it's, blah, 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 blah. it's glorious, glorious, the gloriousness of the cloud. Everything's moving to the cloud. I'm sorry, it's just undeniable. Mm. Um, hey, hey, AWS and Azure, security-wise, got a really, got a really, Garbage. really awesome set of tools and security tools. They got Security Center and Trusted Advisor for AWS there. Uh, they've got they, that gives you like a baseline for security. I'll walk you through a little bit of that. Uh, but it gives you like a baseline for security. It'll scan your network groups, your IAM stuff, your security groups. It's I've got to play with it a lot uh, more recently. It's a lot of fun. Um, one of the tools that I recently found, which is I think is pretty nifty, is uh, the S3 browser. And this is a tool that allows you to upload stuff uh, to your S3 buckets. So it's just like another, I guess you say like an FTP tool, but it ties directly into S3 and allows you to upload stuff pretty easily. Um, it also has a really nifty security scan feature. Uh, it's free for non-commercial use. It is $30 for commercial use, so not that expensive. Um, and we will, again, go back to the demo. They're really using Windows Server 2003. What? Where? On that box, it says, <laughs> <laughs> Windows Server 2003. That was a screenshot I got from Google Images. So whoever's Google Images that is, yeah, <laughs> sure. I probably should take my own screenshot, but I was being lazy. Um, yeah, that is a good. That is a good catch. Though. No, I'm running a. I'm running. I'm running this in a VM. Um, so let's see. Let me spin up the other VM now. Go away. Spin up the Windows 10 box. Come on. The guys are fighting me. All right. So this is S3. And to, to set, I had this set up with my demo. My, my own personal account. Um, you set up your account name, uh, type, and then you set up an access ID and your secret access key. Uh, I've also encrypted my access key with a password. I'm also using SSL TLS for this stuff. And what you can do is, like I said, this, this does a lot of other stuff, but it's got this nifty little security scan tool. And oh, look, there's an open S3 uh, bucket. Uh, and this is something that has hit the news a lot more recently is people putting sensitive data in publicly available S3 buckets. I have been asked to go check um, go check for this stuff, and I've had to manually go through, which is a big pain in the butt, um, go through and look our, for our permissions. And if I can pull it up, yeah. This. So this, this is where my publicly available bucket is there. You, you can see it's, it's, uh, it's access is public. If I go back to the VM, and what's cool about this is I can fix it all then here. 
and I just hit the fix selected issues and it fixes it. And if I refresh the page, it's gone. So one easy way to one not only check for public buckets, but also to fix them. Now, of course, work with the devs who have these to figure out who owns it because it might actually be needed uh, for your application to run. So you don't want to be taking down applications and stuff. Um, and while we, while we are here, we will go into Trusted Advisor. <coughs> So this is what I was talking about here. So within they have and they have other stuff in there like performance and, and stability and other stuff. As you can see there, my I don't have uh, multi-factor authentication on my root account. I'll let you know about that. It'll let you know about well, I am you security groups. Do I have security groups open that shouldn't be? Um, obviously, if you you know upgrade, you can get more of this stuff. Has three bucket permissions, so they're checking it within there. So what, what uh, with the AWS and Azure, there are already tools in there to give you a nice, solid security baseline that doesn't necessarily entirely secure you, but it does walk through a bunch of these different things. Um, another one is like key management. So I am access key rotation. It'll let you know if there are, is, is a key that has been older than 90 days, probably something you want to look at and maybe rotating or expiring altogether. You know, when you set up accounts, you give access keys, and then they can be blown away usually. Um, there's that. Go back to my original display. All right. I, I hate Max, by the way. Almost got it. No. Broken. Demo guts. Where did my? It's it's literally disappeared. The Mac is punishing you because the it is Steve Jobs talking over there in the corner has googly eyes on. It. <laughs> I, I <laughs> Come back. The Mac there is mocking Steve Jobs. Sure. We have a we have a hate hate relationship. So that's the S3 browser, and that's really all the tools I have for this talk. Um, resources. Uh, there's a lot of great resources out there, as I mentioned, and we've gone through several of them. The Open Web Application Security Project. Uh, it's a big nonprofit open source resource for developers. Uh, it's got cheat sheets. It's got um, a knowledge base. It's got tools. It's got all sorts of all sorts of fun stuff to to do and to, to learn from. Uh, podcast. I love podcasts. Two of my favorites are Risky Business, uh, which covers a kind of, which is done by Patrick Gray, and they cover like InfoSec in general. So if you're looking to get more involved in security and get more of a, you know, hear about uh, news and a, you know, he really dives deep into it. He, if he, you know, misspeaks on something the previous week, he will correct that the next week, which is really good to hear. He has like a new segment at the beginning, then he has like a, an interview and like a sponsored interview. Even the sponsored interviews are really good. Um, so, and he will he will try to cut through BS. So if there's, they try to come in with marketing pitches, he'll call BS on it and ask him questions about it. So it's really good. Troy Hunt is one of the top application security professionals out there. He does a video blog every Friday and he, it's available on podcasts in just an audio form. Really like listening to him. He does have I been pwned. He does uh, other uh, other stuff within security um, blogs, plural site. Uh, he's now doing a report URI, which helps with setting up content security policy. So he's a really good resource uh, for for a lot of appsec stuff. And really, he he will also talk about uh, infosec in general. Uh, training options. Um, Troy Hunt does do workshops, among many other things. You can tell him a fanboy. Uh, most of the workshops are in Europe. Um, he does do some on the West Coast when he goes to like RSA and stuff. So um, maybe a little bit harder. He did recently start doing remote workshops where an organization can have him come in and do a remote session with the developers. Um, Tim Tomes, uh, who actually lives up in Greenville. I feel, like he, I feel like he made a movie to Spartanburg. Oh, somewhere up there. 
northwest of us. Um, he does the practical web application penetration testing course. That's actually where I got the VM from with Cone Tunnel. We're, we're trying to get that uh, for OWASP next year. So if you guys want that training. Yes. Yeah. I did that at DerbyCon. It's really good. He's going to be working at Greensville on um, B-Side. So get the oh, Greensville yeah. B-Side. I think he's keynoting, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I talked to him two weeks ago. Yeah, he's a, he's a really great guy. And he does, his, his, his course is focused for developers. Um, that doesn't mean that security people can't take it. But uh, it's focused on what I love about it is that you go break the application for two to three days, and then you spend one to two days remediating it, which is something we don't see a lot within security is actually the remediation actually explaining how you go remediate some of this stuff. Input validation, what does that actually mean? Um, it's also very affordable. Um, you mean SANS people? Like, like work for SANS? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, much. He's much cheaper than Sands, yeah. and you'll probably get just as much out of it if you would like the uh, the web application penetration testing course for Sands, which I've taken that one too. Um, he does a lot of southeast stuff, like you said. Hopefully, he doesn't get it for us, which would be a big get. I might actually come down and see if I can do it again. Mm -hmm. um, he also goes up to Boston. He will also do training for organizations, so he's uh, self-employed. So he will come into an organization and train your developers. Uh, and then Pluralsight. I love Pluralsight. It is 30 bucks a month, $300 for a subscription for a year. I have learned uh, not only AppSec stuff, but I've learned, I've gotten a uh, better understanding of Docker, Jenkins, you know, all the new new technologies going on. Uh, anything by Troy Hunt is good. Uh, securing your Node.js web app, app is uh, one that I recently went through. It's about five and a half hours by Max McCarty. Uh, a lot of good stuff in there about securing Node.js. And then, of course, Threat Modeling Fundamentals by Peter Mosmans. Uh, he, um, it's about an hour and a half long course, so it's not long. And really, you could probably skip some of the stuff and just focus in on the developer uh, way of doing it, which is what we kind of walked, which what we did walk through with Stride and everything. Um, so really great stuff there. And then, of course, um, so final thoughts. That's, that's pretty much into my, my talk, so you do uh, you know, inventory, threat modeling, you have coding activity, so security vulnerabilities are ultimately just bugs. Uh, if anyone has any good ID plugins that they hear about, let me know. <laughs> anyone to hear about them? And then we have tools, you know, static, static, uh, static analyzers, dynamic analyzers, all sorts of fun stuff that can be integrated easily. Um, dynamic analyzers is actually something I'm trying to push toward Q18 and having them do a lot of that stuff while they're testing because a lot of the same functions that you're going to do for uh, testing an application for security is a lot of what QA is going to go do. Does this work? You know, can I click on this link? And then from there, you can just either have them scan and run the report, or you know, uh, however it works. Uh, and really, dynamic analyzers can also be automated and, and put in through the build process to see if you can. Um, well, I don't know if it's a build process, but you can automate some of the dynamic tests to uh, within your process to, to see if that works. I can't speak from experience on that yet because I haven't done that yet. Um, so hopefully this is actionable. If not, um, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, feedback. Give me feedback on this. Was it good? Was it bad? Um, was it awful? Do I need more? Do I need less? This actually runs long. I've only got like 40 to 50 minutes, and I'm always closer to 50 minutes. Um, so that's my information. I run the Explorer for Security Podcast, uh, which I've had Ralph on. I've had Josh on. Actually, Jeff and Adam have been on, too. And Jeff, have you been on? Yeah. 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 I thought so. Um, so it, it's it's a di I cover different uh, secu I have a different security professional on each week to talk about a different security topic. More recently, I've been more appsec focused. So I've had Adam Baldwin from the Node Security Platform Project or from the Node Security <coughs> Platform. I did have Max McCarty who did that Plural Site course. Um, I've had all sorts of people on, and you know, it, it was I, I don't shoot for the high. I shoot for people that actually have something. Uh, really good, like a good message that it's like I want to amplify. So, uh, really good there. On Twitter, at Timothy D. Block. Um, I am so close to 2,000 followers, so please follow me. Timothy D. Block .com and then Timothy D. Block .com. Any questions? I can legally unfollow you, right? <laughs> <laughs> I will destroy you. Sure. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I don't work on that web app side at all. That happened. How is inventory normally kept? Is there any tools that you have? Like, let's just say you have an organization that doesn't have web app inventory. Is there something that can automate it? 
No, that is that is that, and that's the frustrating. That's the frustrating part. And I'm swearing to myself because I actually did have more slides in there that talk about some of the tools you can use. Um, and maybe I'll have to re-add because you asked it now. Um, OWASP dependency track is something that you can set up as a server, and you can log into what it's what it does is you can set up an application and then set up its components, and it'll walk. You can set up the license, the version. And then once you have that in there, it goes out and, and checks for CVEs. So it'll let you know if there's CVEs in it. You can combine that with OWASP, OWASP dependency check. And um, that will go out every 24 hours and look for new CVEs for your application. So that's one way to do it. It's a very manual and tedious thing to do and keep track of. Uh, you know, I, I've done stuff in Confluence, Wikis, you know, really wherever uh, the developers are keeping documentation. Uh, it is is usually where you find that stuff documented. It's it's yeah it's it's one of the more annoying things. If someone just had a tool that would go out and scan your application and tell you everything in there, like that would be awesome. But I haven't found that yet. Is it only done like the version control systems, like at GitHub. Like, what do you, you mean? Know, like the well, not developers. So right. if your organization is using some sort of version control system, all your apps. But, you just, is that how it's normally done? What's typically done is based on your language, there's going to be some sort of package management system, right? So whereas in Python, you're going to use pip to install them, and you're going to have requirements.txt, which is going to list your different requirements. And sometimes it'll have the name of it. Um, sometimes it'll have the name of it and the version, or a version greater than 1.2. And sometimes you run off master or latest, right, if you're doing, if you're doing the source pools. Uh, in the job world, they use Maven, right? Use Maven repos. Same thing with Scala or SBT. So you're going to pull these libraries every time you build because uh, GitHub is for source code control. So you don't keep binaries in GitHub, right? You don't keep those assets there. So what's going to be is going to be requirements.txt, which could be the inventory for the dependencies on your app, right? So that's how you find out what your liabilities are, if like your tech debt from the external things. And so if a version of that comes up on a CVE, Right, and that's how you go back to the requirements.txt on a Python file through your um, Maven configuration, your dependency section of your Maven configuration in a Java application, for example. In the C world, they use NuGet, or sorry, in the .NET world, they use NuGet or whatever else yeah. is the package manager. So that's in Ruby, rate builds them and pulls it in from. Those are just like for package. Like right, yeah, that's your external right? dependencies. For you, but for your stuff, anything in GitHub is going to get scanned by a static code analysis tool, right? Because that's source code, everything else will be binary. It's actually, for nine times out of 10, it's actually open source, right? Anything that's coming out of Maven is probably open source, but sometimes there's a private Maven repo that's cool. That's what you're gonna get in terms of, how do I know if something external has a CVE against it? I meant more so like, how do you keep track of, like let's just say you, whatever your company was doing it, how do you keep track of all the applications your company has if they haven't been doing that? No, I, don't I haven't I haven't found a good solution, I mean, I don't know if anybody else has one, but um, the closest I can get to this is like some like land sweeper, but that's more focused on computers and right uh, networking equipment. So um, yeah, I, it's it, that's one of the tough things right now. And I've actually talked to developers about that because that's one of the first things I do when I walk into an organization that I'm working with the development team on is um, you know where's your documentation? What do you have in your environment? I just noticed my battery. Um, walk, you know, we'll, so I end up usually having to document all this stuff myself, and that's where I build it out. Um, we recently started a new project, and I'm like, okay, we got to inventory, and I'm the person doing it. The developers are going to do it. I have to, they're making decisions about different stuff. Um, uh, so you know, they're making decisions about what they're going to use, and it's like, okay, I need to know that so I can document it. And that's kind of how the relationship is going right now. That's kind of why I put it in this talk was that I'd like to see more developers focus on that because if you think about it, when you know what it's in there and you know there's a new patch available, that's knocking out security vulnerabilities right there within your application. That's that's keeping the application more secure. So yeah, there's nothing good out there right now. It's it's hopefully someone figures out a tool at some point. Couple of things. MF they have um, a yeah, use what scan. Uh, MF has a script called full scan uh -huh. that you can update. Various different CV repositories, export, whatever you can run against an app. Can I tell you some CVs here? Does yeah. Nessus have something that will look at an application and t pick it apart? Mm -hmm. so, it'll give you a baseline. All, yeah. Huh? It'll give you a baseline. Baseline. 
Now, now I'm trying to think of if there is a way to do that with some kind of vulnerable, like vulnerable, like Nessus. What other, is there anything open source? For a couple different CV scanners. Um, Frank actually told me you use the MMAP scanner to send a Git request over all of the different ports. Okay. Um, Frank Catucci? Yeah. I'm not to text him. But I, I just use full scan. Uh, it's just if it's an app, port 80. Uh -huh. And I updated it. It goes up and scans. It, it, but only does port 80? I mean, but we'll tell you all the components of the application too. Well, of the components. I mean, so even if you list your components, so, so if I've got like a rake file or a Python, I got requirements that TXT has got my stuff in there. You have to remember those have requirements, yeah. right? So anytime you pull something, there's a tree, right? You always end up dumping these into whatever the doc files that you use with BizGraph or whatever graph it is. Right. right. So you can look because it's a hierarchy, but there's the, whatever it is, your dependency goes track goes deep. Like left pad, I guarantee nobody takes left pad as a first level dependency in their Node.js mm -hmm. application. Right, it's buried sixty. We did so. Here's something to that point: is we we did um, we had uh, I had the one of the junior devs uh, do an npm list of all our known packages or all the known modules and packages we're using, and all of our entire application. It was over five thousand. Yeah. Now we were do I mean we got rid of the dupes and stuff and it was down to still like over a thousand. But uh, and a lot of that a lot of the five thousand count was dependency of dependency of dependency and stuff. And how much of that when you say you deduped it, is, are you deduping uh, across versions or just different so we have like, you know, services and within the API and stuff, like there's different services within there that will will have like like we just want a, a but are you, are you certain that you didn't have like two versions of left pad, for instance, that were... Can I say again? Can you? Yeah, in different I mean, so, so, of the application. Like, there's something called a, satisf a satisfiability set, the SAT, right? Analyzer to see whether or not the problem can be solved or satisfiable. But in always, you have six layer 8 and then layer 9 deep. Both need a login library, but they're both expecting different versions. That's the DLL hell, the virtual environment piece we're talking about, right? So. Eventually, you have to have ways to deconflict those. Right. Plus, you always have master going for it, right? Some people like to, I mean, the problem with the bleeding edge is on the blood, right? So, a lot of people like to listen to master, like whatever dev cut is of something versus whatever latest stable is. You also, if you've got a robust build environment, you track stable plus dev because you want to be able to move forward because dev is going to always move past not as a 10 year security vulnerabilities. Right. But the problem is it can break your application in production. So, you have to mm -hmm. test against both the test against the matrix. Yeah. That's the whole sec DevOps model, right? Eventually, is that you? I don't like sec DevOps. I think it's just DevOps. Security should be embedded. We're not really that special. Yeah. Well, but in that case, security is just testing. Right? Yeah. That's just, just that's all. But that's all. Security is just a bug, right? Well, we're just yeah, exactly. We're just we're really just hall monitors. We really want to be self-deprecating. <laughs> yeah. You can't do that. You didn't do that right. And, but that's what it is. Is 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 a lot of times you know MongoDB kept getting hacked because people were just. Didn't realize the default, you know, is throw it out on the internet, available for everybody. With you can just connect it, to yeah, it. the default is super right. availability. So it's it's a, it's a lot about configuring things properly, coding things properly. You know, that's really all it is: is doing things the way they're supposed to be done. Yeah, but my car's got seatbelts, right? <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I mean, we have and we have, yeah. You know. Only Honda turns them on automatically. <laughs> <laughs> Are they doing that now? No, the old ones. Oh, right. the track. Subaru. Subaru used to have it. I wouldn't pay for Subaru, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't a soccer mom in Asheville? No. <laughs> now, the hard part for me is being a security person, I don't speak developer in a mumbo jumbo. So you I don't need to. I don't well, speak mumbo jumbo. I came from the sysadmin network admin side. You know what, you know what speaks to a developer? Playing ping pong with them. And I'm not even kidding. Not even kidding. You get to know them. You start talking movies. You start playing video games. You start um, doing other stuff. I, and that's 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 be, the thing. Be I was a very, human being before you come in and like, hey, dude, right? Shit's on the fucker. <laughs> right. And that's the thing. That's that's why that's why I had the security window there because I'm coming in as a guy. I don't have a programming background, so I am you know I'm trying to get better at it. But there's no way that I'm going to keep up with a developer that's got 10 years in, and I'm, you know, in the last couple of years I've gotten this session, you know, trying to do some development here and there. There's no way I'm going to keep up with them, so I don't even try. So I'm, I'm open, 
And like, I'm open with them about that fact, but I'm also open with the fact of I'm curious. So I go to them and say, hey, explain to me how this works. I'm trying to understand this better. And that, and they love explaining that kind of stuff to people, you know, especially if it's something that they built, they love talking about their faith. So, I mean, yeah. it's like, that's how I've approached it is I've just been more personal. And, and also I don't freak out like, as, as you know, a lot of security people tend to do about stuff, I don't call them stupid. Either. Like I'm treating them like a person. I also am sitting with them. So if I start calling them stupid, it's gonna I'm gonna have a hard time with them. Yeah. Um, so like you don't have to you don't have to speak their language. You just have to be curious about their language. If you're curious about their language, they'll teach you. So and it's been it's been very beneficial. That like I said, that that was the role I was hired into. That was the intention. Was I'm going to go sit with the developers. Which was absolutely scary the first time I did that because I am getting fish eyed like crazy. But that's the other thing is they know there's a security person in there looking at their stuff now, so they are on their best behavior at that point. So there's, you know, a little bit of that as well. It's like they know I'm in the room, so they're trying to be more security conscious about stuff because management's going to take security seriously. But don't, don't they have code reviews? I mean, so do you use yeah. GitHub pull requests? We do. Peer, yeah, we do peer review. Um, um, we also have the static analog like a set in place. So yeah, do y'all track coverage for like code for test coverage and stuff like that? QA has a different angle. <laughs> it's more for us. It's more user functionality than it is actual what you'd like out of a QA, which is looking at code going, yeah, we need to fix this. So it's more, hey, something's broke. Can you guys go take a look at it and fix it? Which yeah, so. Yeah, that's that's something I'm still trying to learn is you know unit tests and makes it code coverage and things like that. So. Any other questions, comments? Was this good for you guys? It, do you feel like I because I, I feel like I do a lot of this stuff on a regular basis, so I'm like, this is stupid. Like I do this all the time. I've talked about Zap in like three different talks already. So I it's like I don't know that I'm adding a lot of value to people. So I mean yeah, like the demo or the demos. All right, so. right. That's that's what I'm. Yeah, I'm trying to do more of that stuff. I typically don't do a lot of demos, but yeah, it's it's. I think it's something that showing it is a lot better. For it. What about you? Did you? Yeah, I learned stuff. You did learn stuff. Yeah. Okay. Because and that's the thing too is I'm trying to squeeze stuff in, and it's I only have 40 minutes in November. So. And yeah, the the problem with the. A forty-minute slot to cover this much ground is that you end up like, look, there's a tree and there's a rock and there's a bird, that, and that's what it was. I feel like some of my transitions are kind of like, okay, we're moving on, let's go. So, um, and I've cut out slides. Like I, I did have that in there, but I was like, that's, I didn't expect someone to ask me that. I was like, no one's gonna care about tracking and doc, actually documenting it. So nobody actually cares about inventory. They don't. Like security <laughs> people are awful about it. So. Documentation is the thing everyone sucks. Like, oh, the website wasn't updated for two months. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> two months is generous. I wouldn't worry about the transitions. I mean, I'm not in the field. Uh -huh. I didn't have trouble with the transitions. But as a presenter, uh -huh. who presents, you know, in another field, people don't want to show up and be bored. Right. I mean, their time is valuable. They right. Want and that's what I focus on too. Is I'm trying to like at least make it a little bit. Coherent? I don't know. No, I, I, to me, I mean, of course, I didn't understand all of it, right. but I didn't have any difficulty tracking along the way. Okay, cool. That's good enough. Yeah, it's like I have like forty-seven slide, slides in this slide, <laughs> so I've got I've got less than a minute to get through each one, so I've got to keep moving pretty quick. And like I said, I deleted like five last night, so I was over fifty. <laughs> what uh, what do you what else, what do you presented? Um, five rocks and cable. Okay. Like you said, that, that sounds like something that it's, has a little bit of challenge to manage. It's, I mean, it's like everything. If you're in it, you're like, oh. right. But everybody else you talk to is going, you know, <laughs> right. And your goal is just to kind of dumb it down enough, but right. without lying. To help them see the light. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, it burns your retina, and you wonder what happened. I was going to invite you to go out and get wings with us, but now. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. Too funny. All right. So um, before we wrap up, um, anybody need to get on the list there? Is it already here? Anybody wants? After this talk, like, no, I'm never coming back here again. <laughs> right. 
Sorry. Yeah, yeah, the cola cyclist sir. You can get on it. I haven't heard from anybody. So. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I've been paying more attention to Slack. Yeah, Slack's where it's at. Slack is where it's at, apparently. All of you need to get day jobs because you go on and on for all day long. I, I'm with you, man. <laughs> I go in there and it's like, I'm not going to even bother. Close. <laughs>